Good Wednesday morning, June 26th, just a little bit before 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Michael Clark with BAM Weather. Today we're going to talk about excessive rains continuing, the wet get wetter, more severe weather risks. We've had uh, over 3,000 severe weather reports in the month of June. It's been unbelievably active in the severe weather department. That probably continues into July along with a significant heat risk mid to late July that we're going to talk about today as well. And, of course, updates on our thought process for the yields. Uh, you caught me in my element this morning, got my hat backwards, got my sitting back here on my porch, and we've had some, some rain move through, right? Uh, looks uh, nice. They'll take rain. We need rain here in Indiana, uh, but we are about to get a lot of it, and we're going to dive into those details right now. Heat waves to continue into July. Major heat mid to late July is, is, is possible. Um, the pattern will turn wetter where it has been drier. Storm cluster risks can, to continue, and the folks that have been inundated with over a foot of rain in some of the, the most populated or dense uh, corn-growing areas in the, in the grain belt, get uh, they're wet, they're going to get wetter, and we're going to talk about all of that. This is a look at this. This is the severe weather reports month to date for June. I think it's like 3,050 if you add all these up. And, and it, what I think is really, really interesting is the the uh, concentration of severe weather reports that have happened in the grain belt. I mean, it's been really, really remarkable here how much severe weather we've seen in the grain belt here. Uh, you could you could argue this is probably about 75% of the severe weather uh, reports here that have come in the month of June have come where we are, are growing crop here in the United States, a remarkable number of severe weather reports. Uh, you look at yesterday's severe weather reports, it's right in the heart of the belt, and, and, and the southern grain belt, if you will, not in the heaviest uh, growing areas, but regardless, a lot of crop grown here um, where you're seeing these severe weather reports and the very, very heavy rainfall that's ongoing this morning as well um, across some of these areas. So just remarkable, 467 severe weather reports on the 25th. Look at the 24th, that storm cluster that moved through, 166 reports there, 254 reports on June 22nd. Uh, through Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, northern Indiana, and northwest Ohio there as well. All right, month-to-date rainfall in June. Well, this is where the problem is, obviously. Um, in fact, this area here, wetting, uh, running, <laughs> wetting, it's running uh, the wettest in history in 132 years. June to date, it's the wettest it's been. You come out here to the east, it's the driest it's been. What's going on? Well, there's been a ridge, and it's shooting up moisture both across the top and the southwest, and that's that's what it's what's allowed for this extreme pattern of <coughs> uh, very wet in the in the west and very dry in the east. You see the precipitation ranks from 132 years, one being the wettest, 132 being the driest. So we have literally the driest in history and the wettest in history, uh, and 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 a lot of dryness in between. Okay. So the moisture has been running around the periphery of this ridge, and we've been sending disturbances up and through here. And I don't see a lot of indication of that stopping. It has kept the northern, northwestern third of the grain belt cooler than normal. But Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, uh, warm to, to uh, war much warmer than average, especially up across New England, um, as this ridge has waffled uh, uh, west and east. Our original June outlook had the most intense heat. Uh, out here across the, the western, southwestern U.S. That has verified well, uh, for sure. We were a little bit cooler up in here, but the month is going to end cooler up into the Great Lakes and the interior northeast as well. The uh, 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 overall uh, soil moisture update here, this is a look at the soil moisture uh, percent, uh, the, the relative uh, soil moisture percentage or available water, if you will. Um, it's a big, long, sportless list. Uh, Big, big, long acronym for what it means. But again, you can see where the soil moisture <clears throat> is is okay or way too wet in a part of the U.S. It is very, very dry across the Western Plains as well. Look at the two-week change. I think that's a little bit more significant here. Uh, the two-week change is just is remarkable. And that's because where that high pressure set up, where it's waffled back and forth, uh, it has zapped these soils of moisture. I can speak for myself here at home. A month to date, I, I don't know. It's not been much. I, 
looking at my weather station over there. I can't see it from here, but I had much rain. Uh, that's going to change. That's going to change. Let's look at uh, the rainfall forecast in just a second. But in the last seven days, guys, southern Minnesota, southeastern South Dakota, northwestern Iowa, northern uh, Nebraska, some places in here have had over 15 inches of rain. You know, we've got a lot of clients out there, a lot of folks telling us that you know, crops underwater, you know, even in tiled fields, it's not really mattering. All right, something to really consider. Uh, a lot of a lot of guys are like, yeah, you know, the rain makes grain record crop. Uh, when you start talking about that much rain, that's not that's not it. It doesn't. You can't do that. <laughs> uh, I think most of us are smart enough to know that. But you know, some of these people that that um, they don't. And it's too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and especially when it comes to moisture, water. All right, so just keep that in mind here. Looking at rainfall the next five days, this is the GFS, uh, latest overnight GFS run. Again, like I said, the areas that have been dry, they're going to start working in some rainfall. That's because the, uh, the, the U.S. ridge is going to start to reestablish a little bit further south and west for a time. And the flow pattern is going to go right over the central grain belt. And in fact, there is some signaling from the ensembles that this could get pretty, pretty uh, significantly wet the next 10 days. So there's your one to five day rainfall. And then here's your 5 to 10. Okay, again, continuing to see a, sig a significantly wetter pattern risk. Still seeing wet for Minnesota, Dakotas, and Iowa uh, for places that don't need the rainfall there. Okay, now I want to show you the flow pattern overall the next 10 days from the GFS model. And you can see what I'm talking about. You see the ridge down here start to expand. There's nothing underneath that ridge. But all the energy, the yellows, oranges, and reds that flows around the top of that ridge on the west side of it over here, in the, in the four corners, and it flows over the top. Okay, I'm going to get to a certain point here and pause it for you and show you kind of a, what I'm concerned about. You can see that the ridge is kind of sprawled out here in this particular run of the GFS. You see it's sprawled out here across the south central U.S., and what we're doing is, is there's this quasi-stationary boundary. Quasi-stationary meaning it's it moves a little bit, but for the most part it's stationary. And it's, it's putting in a lot of energy and moisture in across this area for an extended period of time. Whenever you have instability, heat, <clears throat> moisture, these can be training events of very heavy rainfall over the same areas multiple times, indicating an above normal rainfall risk. The European model over the next 10 days, uh, oh, why it keeps getting this change case on there, I apologize. The European model over the next 10 days would indicate um, an epicenter of, of, of very, very heavy rainfall here. Uh, in fact, a, a really, really heavy risk there, western Illinois, northern Missouri, southern Iowa. In terms of the next 10 days from normal, there's a strong indication there of, uh, of rainfall um, you know, being potentially problematic. This is a look, if you break it down, the 5 to 10 day, this is the GEFS, and there's the European. Again, they're both really wet, and you can see where they're really dry across Texas, which, by the way, if you're in Texas, I'm really worried about a lot of heat and, and not much rain. Uh, Texas, I don't like what I see down there for you folks right now, unfortunately. All right, so um, what's going on? What's the pattern doing? Well, the SOI, or the Southern Oscillation Index, is fluctuating. That's the pressure differences between Tahiti and Darwin down there in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, southern Pacific Ocean. And when you go positive SOI, it's an indication of La Nina. When you go negative SOI, it's an indication of El Nino. You see the fluctuations. We're back and forth. We're back and forth, right? The negative SOI is the uh, El Nino, and it, it delivers cold fronts. All right, it can deliver cooler weather and wet too. But there's the the result of the negative SOI right now is a front coming through here in the next few days. Well, we've had a big spike in the SOI. Okay, we were at about minus uh, 37 points in the SOI. To the latest rise now has put us at almost plus 20. It's a huge rise, almost a 50-point rise. Um, that's an indication of heat and La Nina-like conditions and uh, widespread sprawled out heat to return as we get into that, probably right into that second week of July. Okay, um, It'll continue to keep the pattern active, but the July 10th through, uh, I'm sorry, July 5th through the 10th here, you can start to see the return of this European ensemble says, there's that 594, the epicenter of that ridge, and here's the flow pattern up and over that. That would indicate continued bouts of moisture, where I think in 10 days from now, or by next week's weather and yield, or two or two weeks from now, we're, we're talking about excessive moisture in areas that were dry. 
by the way. Okay? Again, too much rain can end up being a bad thing. Temperatures from normal, well, anytime you're 3 to 5 degrees from normal temperatures in the second week of July, that's very hot. There's no question about it. I think it can actually start to get even hotter mid to late July. I think the risk for, for significant heat can increase. Big North Pacific Ridge is trying to establish here. Byproduct of the negative angular momentum, we're seeing ridging setting up across the northern hemisphere. And uh, I think it could the result of this could be significant heat, major heat, mid-July. I think the only thing that could save a stretch of 100 degree plus days is by that time there may be uh, sufficient soil moisture or excess soil moisture content um, that may limit the extreme heat but make it incredibly muggy and humid with very norm, uh, warm nighttime low temperatures, mid-upper 70s. You can kind of see the correlation to where we would put that. It would keep the pattern active, though. It's still going to be wet, I believe, in that regard. Okay, so there's the 16 to 30 day outlook. Extremely above normal temperatures across Oklahoma, the Arklatex regions of the deep south. The much above normal will stretch into the southern half of the grain belt. I think for a time it can cover most of the grain belt with much above normal temperatures in mid-July for sure. We're blowing the CDD data, the, the cooling degree data, uh, for people running the ACs from where we're blowing that out of the water, uh, especially from the 30-year average at 155. We're forecasting a 200. That's, that's impressive. Okay, that's a lot of heat. Um, all right, so the 16 to 30-day uh, rainfall pattern will continue to run wet. And again, the areas that are already wet, Minnesota, Iowa, Dakotas, Wisconsin, it's, it's not good. Uh, too much of a good thing does in fact become a bad thing. And that's the kind of the thought process right now. Top three analogs that we're watching as we get into July, as of our latest uh, research and thought process here, 2022, 2016, and 2011. All right, and you can see, you can see this. You can see the thought process on the map. It's a ridge of high pressure. It's exactly what the data is doing. Texas is going to go super hot and dry, no question. Flow pattern up and around with the top wet, all right? But still well above normal temperatures, and a lot of that's probably going to come from very, very warm, elevated nighttime low temperatures. Uh, if you want to know what that can do to the crop, um, I mean, we're not talking detrimental, but research 2010. Look at what happened in 2010 with its yields, right? Go go back and look at the research there. Warm overnight lows uh, are not going to, you know, they're not going to drive record yields. That's the, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, in fact, the trend line is still a half a point below normal with the corn yields, all right? It's, you notice uh, really since 20, about 2019, we really haven't had a significant trend one way or the other. Overall, it's been below trend. Um, and and a, a lot of our years here, like 10 and 11, are below trend as well. 16 is what's weighting it up a little bit um, because we double weighted it. Here's the thing, again, that I want to make sure we understand. Um, we're not thinking it's below normal yields because it's going to get hot and dry. We're thinking it's stormy, excessively wet, with warm nighttime temps. That's our formula, or our thought process right now for the potential of below trend yields, okay, from a weather standpoint. All right, so this whole good to great crop rating stuff, I, don't, I just don't believe it. I just don't buy it. I don't care what they say. I don't, you know, I, I, I live, I'm, I have, I'm surrounded by crop. It's, it's everywhere, all right? Um, it rolls up every day around here, just rolls up, and it's not tall. Um, it needs rain, um, and, you know, it, so I'm just saying uh, we, 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 we need to use our heads here. It hasn't rained in the eastern belt, and it's rained too much in the heaviest, uh, densest growing area for corn in the corn belt. So they've gotten 15 inches of rain. We have to factor these things in. The math doesn't math, right? Soybeans, right now, the, the, the latest idea is slightly up from trend. Here's the, the wild card for soybeans. It's really 2016 because in 2016, what happened was is a big ridge set up uh, it, it, over the Great Lakes, but it was just east. And what happened is we got a return flow of precip up on the west side. The, the core of the heat was a little north and east of the, the soybean belt. 
we do think there's a ridge this year in August. If the placement of that ridge is further east and can allow precip to come up the west side of it, let me illustrate this for you so you see what I'm talking about. Uh, there's indications that there can be a big ridge here somewhere in August. If it's on the east side of this, it's going to be good for beans, like in 2016. If it's further in the middle or over on the west side of this, it's going to shut off moisture in the soybean belt and make it hot. Regardless, there's a signal for a ridge over the Great Lakes. The axis or the epicenter of where that ridge is is still up for debate. So that's what we're going to continue to watch for the soybean yield. Okay. Share this with a friend. Thanks for tuning in Weather and Yield today. Subscribe to the YouTube channel to get the latest. We'll see you next week.